In this video, we're going to take a look at the logistic differential equation. So to this point, we've worked only with unlimited exponential growth, meaning there was no upper bound. We could continue growing forever and ever. Our differential equation looked like dy over dt equals ky, and we've worked very extensively with finding the general solution and, of course, particular solutions to that form. So the general solution always had the form of y equals ce to the kt. Now we're going to take a look at applications like population growth where there's often some upper limit. So there's only so much growth that can occur, and after that point, growth will not occur. So that upper limit is called the carrying capacity and is denoted with the letter L. And you can see the difference in the two pictures, the unlimited growth, exponential growth, and then of course logistic growth is going to uh, increase originally like our unlimited growth model, then it starts to level out and then stops, it doesn't stop growing, it continues to maintain that upper level just below that carrying capacity L, so that is an asymptote. I want to take you through how the logistic differential equation becomes our general model. Now, if you don't care, which is fine, uh, because some of this may be above your mathematical ability at this point, because you perhaps have not learned partial fractions yet. So if you want to just take my word for it that this equation becomes this model, then you can skip forward in this video until you see a yellow star in the top left corner. If you'd like to see where all of this came from, I'm going to take you through this, and I've written it out ahead of time just so I don't mess up, which I typically don't do, but anyways, we're just gonna go with it. So a couple of things that make this question tricky is first of all, we have this equation um, after separation of variables. Now, there's nothing wrong with that equation except that I have a complex fraction. So here in white, you can see that what I've done is I've taken this complex fraction, the fraction within a fraction, and said, let's clean that up a little bit. So by cleaning it up, I am going to just rewrite this one as L over L. And the reason I did that is so then I could combine L over L with Y over L to make it L minus Y over L. And then to get rid of the fraction within a fraction, I moved the L up to the numerator. So this is my new fraction that I will put, replace here. So here is my new integral. I'm integrating L over Y times L minus Y dY. And then on the right side, I have K dT. Now, again, the problem is that I have to integrate and I'm going to have to use partial fractions. So if you've never used partial fractions before, this is by no means a tutorial on exactly how to do it, but I'll take you through the general process. So when we use partial fractions, we need to have our denominator factored. So lucky for us, we already have a factor of y and a factor of l minus y. So notice what I've done is I've taken the integral and I've separated it into a over y, the first factor, and b over l minus y, the second factor. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to just sort of forget about the fact that this is an integration for just a second. And I want to simplify. So what I've done is I've taken everything on each side, multiplied by y times l minus y over 1. And so on the left side, you can see that the de denominator is gone completely, and I have only l over 1, which is just l. And a, for my a, the y would have canceled out, leaving me with a times l minus y. And for b, the l minus y would have canceled out, but I still would have b times y. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take this equation, and there's different ways to go about this, but the easiest way is to just 
substitute values that are going to make our lives easier. What I'm trying to do is solve for A and solve for B. So the first thing I did is I looked at the fact that B was being multiplied by Y. And if I'm trying to get just A or B, not both, into the question, then a very easy way to get rid of B is to let Y equal zero. So I'm choosing to let Y equal zero because I know that that's going to result in B times zero, which is going to get rid of B from my question so I can focus on the value of A. So that's what I've done here. I have the L equals A times L minus zero. Again, I've replaced Y with zero. And that gives me L equals A times L and the B times zero is gone. Dividing each side by L leaves me with A equals one. Now the second one, same idea. What I have to do in order to get uh, rid of A is to let Y equal L. So most of the time we don't have to replace our variable with another variable, but in this case, because I have L minus Y, I'm going to let Y equal L, therefore I'm going to get L minus L, which of course is zero, so A times zero is going to go away. And if you'll notice what happens, I get L on the left, and on the right I get B times L. So L equals BL, just like before I divide each side by B and find that B is one. So what does all that mean? Well, that means I'm now going to rewrite my integral using those partial fractions. So that's what I've done here, is I have rewritten my left side of my integral using partial fractions. From here, I'm just going to do the same thing that we have been doing. So from here, it's all stuff that you've done before. So if I integrate the left side, I get the natural log of y minus the natural log of l minus y. And if I integrate the right side, I get kt plus c. I'm going to multiply everything by a negative because I don't really want to have my numerator um, I'm sorry, my denominator to be L minus Y. I would rather to have L minus Y in the numerator just because it's easier to deal with. So notice by taking everything by negative one, which is what I did to get this step. Now I'm just going to combine these two. So using the laws of uh, logarithms, if I have a um, subtraction, if I'm subtracting, that becomes a denominator. If I'm, you know, adding, that becomes the numerator. So notice I've just rewritten the stuff I've now outlined in green as the natural log of L minus Y over Y, and I didn't do anything to the right side. Now I'm going to exponentiate, so E to the power of each side, and of course on the left side, that means the E and the natural log will cancel, and I'll have the absolute value of L minus Y over Y. And on the right side, I've got e to the negative kt minus c. Just as we did before, this e to the negative kt minus c is the same as e to the negative kt, e to the negative c. And then I've just said, let's take e to the negative c and call it b. Now, typically I would call it c, but because your textbook uses b, I just called it b instead. So that's how I got to here. And now again, remember, I'm trying to get y by itself. So I have rewritten L minus Y over Y to L minus Y, I'm sorry, L over Y minus one because it was Y over Y, which of course is one. And then I added one to each side and then I simply multiplied by Y on each side and divided by all of that B E to the negative KT plus one. So that is the solution this is how it's written in your book. Notice all they've done is just switch around the order of one and b e to the negative kt. So hopefully that was of interest to you. I know I always like to know where things came from and that is where it came from. Welcome back to those of you who are waiting to see the yellow star. Now we're going to take a look at a question that involves the logistic growth function. Uh, we're going to do several parts together and we're going to utilize our calculator. So the question says the size of a population of rabbits is given by the formula P of T is equal to 1000 divided by 1 plus E to the 4.8 minus 0.7 T. 
t is the number of months after several rabbits are released. We're going to graph the function and then find the number of rabbits at time 0, months, 5 months, and 9 months. So we're going to do all of that with our calculator and then we'll do a couple other parts to this question together as well. As you can see, I've already opened my calculator and entered the formula exactly as it is. Now if I just choose graph or if I choose zoom 0, it's going to not show me the entire function. We already talked about the fact that this function should start off as an exponential growth function and then it's going to level out because we have that carrying capacity. So I'm going to go to my window and just change it from 0 to 40. Whoops, I keep fat fingering that. So go back to my window, 0 to 40. Uh, scale of 1 is just fine. The y min, I'm going to go from 0 to 1500, oh, not 15,000, 1500, with a y scale of, say, 100. And now when I graph it, I can see what I was looking for, which is where it's going to sort of level out. So that's what our graph should look like, and again, if you've got um, an emulator like this, you usually can take a screenshot of that picture, but it gives you a good idea of what we're dealing with. Now, if I go back to my main screen, I can click on vars and y vars and function. Now, I've entered that function into my y1, so instead of having to do the math myself, I can just put y1 and then 0, and that tells me that at time t equals 0, there are 8.16, or about 8 rabbits. Again, second enter will um, give me that same function again. I'm going to replace 0 with 5 to get 214 rabbits. And second enter again, whoops, second enter again, and replace 5 with 9, and find that at 9 months there are about 818 rabbits if I round up. For the last part of this question, I could also use my calculator, but it would kind of be cheating. So we're going to actually do the math here. Um, we want to know when there will be 650 rabbits, and then I will show you how you can check using your calculator. So 650 rabbits, I'm going to replace P of T with 650, and I'm going to recopy the rest of my function, 1 plus E to the 4.8 minus 0.7t. I don't like all of that as the denominator, so I'm going to multiply each side by that. So I have 1 plus e to the 4.8 minus 0.7t. And on the same step, just to make it clean, I'm going to divide each side by 650. So that leaves me with this. Now I'm going to do a little bit of reduction. So I'm going to rewrite what I have on the left side of my equation and on the right side 1000 um, divided by 650 I can rewrite as 20 over 13 and then I'm actually going to subtract that one from each side so it's going to get rid of the one from the left side and on the right side I'm subtracting one which is 13 thirteenths so that leaves me on the left side with just e to the 4.8 minus 0.7t and on the right side, 20 minus 13 is 7 thirteenths. So I'm getting closer, again, trying to solve for t. As we've done before, when we have an exponential function, I'm just going to take the natural log of each side. So if I take the natural log of the left side, that's going to get rid of that e to the power. And so the result is just the power, which is 4.8 minus 0.7t. And on the right side, I have just the natural log of 7 thirteenths. Do not find that as a decimal until you get to the very end of the question or you're going to get the solution wrong. So keep everything as exact as possible. From here, obviously, I'm going to subtract 4.8. So I have negative 0.7t equals the natural log of 7 thirteenths minus 4.8. And then I'm going to divide everything by negative 0.7. So t is equal to the natural log of 7 thirteenths minus 4.8 divided by negative 0.7. Now I can get my calculator out. 
and I can approximate my solution to be about 7.74 months. And again, just pay attention to if they want you to round up, round to a certain decimal place, etc. But it's 7.74 months. It's possible to use your calculator to check your work. So notice I have my original equation in Y1, just as I had it before. In Y2, I've entered 650, which is the question said, when will there be 650 rabbits? If I go back to my graph, you can see that I have two lines now, and I'm interested in where those two lines cross. So if I go to second and calc, I'm looking for that point of intersection. And so the first curve, is my blue curve and it doesn't matter which one the first curve is but I'm going to choose that and the second curve is obviously the red line it doesn't matter what the guess is so now I press enter and notice it says 7.7414846 so that is great because when we did this by hand we got about 7.74 rabbits up next we're going to take a look at first order linear differential equations